cool. Let's back up. All right. That was weird. It's the first time that's yeah. happened. Welcome everyone to the DeFi Standard. It's Mickey B. Fresh, and I got so interesting day today. Uh, sorry if anyone's a Bitcoin Maxi today. Um, I think you just uh, got gut punched uh, pretty hard from uh, one of the biggest names. Uh, yeah, I saw, and then Julian Chatterley. <clears throat> but you know, I mean, what did people really think? I mean. He makes electric cars, the biggest electric car companies pushing off green energy, and they're going to accept payments in Bitcoin. So that transaction is equal to 74 gallons of gas. Just think of it like that. And then they're going to sell you an electric car. So, I mean, it, it's an oxymoron. I don't know what he was thinking. Um, I think it was a marketing stuff. Just thing to just get publicity and get his um, name and Tesla just out into the media and into the uh, crypto sphere and industry. And then he jumped on Doge. So, I mean, he knows those are jokes. I mean, um, what's your thoughts, Patty? Did he have any other motivation? Oh, Patty's got no mic. Hold on. What's going on here? Patty's got no mic. You really don't have mic? Is that true? I don't know. All right, let's try and add the other one then. Really? I have it set up the same way. You know I'll just go to the same. All right, I think we're good now. Can y'all hear me now? One one. Yep. Uh, I think they cool. hear you. Patty, say something. Hey, can y'all hear me? Yes. All right, I just had you on the wrong scene. Awesome. Sorry about that. Back to where you are, Patty. <laughs> yeah, not the first time we've done that, no, but it'll I be hate fun OBS. for us. <laughs> yeah, that's something we got to look into. But um, yeah, some people have fun listening to this when it gets, you know. Uh, posted afterwards but yeah aside from that on the whole elon musk 
issue and everything. So, you know, either he is going through like a midlife crisis and is just, you know, swift and back and forth every which way, or obviously I think he knows what kind of power he has uh, through social media and his statements. Um, you know, I can really think this all started back when the um, GameStop issue was going on, he was high on that. And then shortly after he hopped into Doge and Tesla got into Bitcoin. But, you know, Tesla had to know the carbon footprint of Bitcoin and that like the energy product or the energy usage from that network, you know, rivals some, you know, smaller European nations energy output. And, you know, I think they they went into Bitcoin knowing it's probably one of the least volatile of the cryptos right now, just by the nature of it, like, you know, having a lot more capital under it. And, you know, they're looking for a hedge from the U.S. dollar and to get out of that just because, like, we're seeing inflation kick up big time. So, I mean, I think they did that purely from a financial standpoint, even though they knew those issues. But now he's getting ready to move on. Um, we know how, like basically like the cancel culture that's going on. So I think with him, you know, behind electric cars, even though the you know battery power comes from like other stuff, like coal is producing electricity. So, you know, I think you could go after him from that, but on his face, it's supposed to be a green company and, you know, easily he could get called out and you see how companies get railroaded these days into doing stuff. So I think he's getting ahead of it. And, you know, I saw he put out that tweet about working with uh, doge devs. So, you know, I don't really know exactly what that means. That's the problem with the tweets. They're so vague and you're not really sure what it means. And of course, you know, everybody's just following uh, specific individuals in the markets these days and what they're doing to decide if they want to buy or sell in the short term. Um, but I know you have some interesting thoughts about him, especially in what he could be uh, doing in the future. Uh, yes, I do. Um, we're going to play that after. So. Here's what I want to talk about with the whole Elon thing. So there you pulling up the video. I'm going to pull up one of the videos right now. You can see it on the screen, right? Um, yeah. This isn't about just accepting cryptocurrency. Elon's going to go out there and be like, pick me, pick me to the next crypto. It's going to be Cardano. It's going to be XRP. You know, this is just the early stages. Tesla is a going to be self-driving cars. This is Internet of Things. This is streaming payments. This is new applications where machine to machine payments are going to take place. So how I think he's looking at the crypto um, industry and blockchain in general and the new technology is far beyond just, you know, um, accepting this payment or even holding on the balance sheet. Um, and this is where I think Ripple comes in. And back in 2013, um, Chris Larson, they were talking about machine to machine payments streaming them, building the internet of value, because you can't do that in today's legacy payment rails. And where is Tesla going to go? You're going to have these self-driving cars. They're going to have their own digital wallets. They're going to have to be able to pay for energy, um, for example. So let's listen to, um, this is Chris Larson, right? I think it's this one. Okay. Yeah. No. Um, and you can use any form of ledger. So whether it be a distributed ledger, decentralized ledger, whether it be PayPal, a centralized ledger, Chase, whatever. Um, anyway, sorry. About that. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> oh, oh. oh, there it goes. Now it's working. It's going now. Oh, All right. Just fix it. Autonomous. Uh, you can hear it now. Money transmitting systems in the cloud in the ether. I can't. Sh sure. Yeah. No, we're really excited about Codius, and uh, you know that's Stefan Thomas and Evan Schwartz, uh, absolutely brilliant engineers who have been spearheading that, along with a, 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 a increasing number of our of our staff. Um, so a lot of it is obviously smart contracts. Smart contracts have traditionally been attached to distributed ledgers. 
Um, I think originally it was thought that you have distributed ledger first and then you'd have smart contracts built on top of it. We've sort of taken a different approach with Codius in, um, in making them two completely separate streams so that with Codius you can both use any programming language um, and you can use any form of ledger. So whether it be a distributed ledger, decentralized ledger, whether it be PayPal, a centralized ledger, Chase, whatever, um, we think um, those uh, smart contracts should be able to tie uh, anything of value from any counterparty or non-counterparty. So that's a, a kind of a fundamental foundation of it. But what that should do then is allow, to your point, um, the idea of autonomous agents. So a good example would be, you know, today the only kind of autonomous agent that can exist is basically uh, a virus, which is uh, usually having to do bad things to support itself. Um, originally, the idea behind viruses was that you'd have benevolent viruses, and we think with things like autonomous agents that can think, think of a program that can exist in the wild and kind of have a bank account. You know, again, uh, you, know, you know, an application cannot go to Chase and open a bank account, which means it can't support itself. Um, it can't take in payments from customers. It can't hire developers to improve itself. And something like Codius would allow that to happen. So you might have a world where you have benevolent uh, agents running around that could actually be antibodies for viruses. That would be one example, taking the place of antivirus um, companies. You could have uh, an autonomous agent that would be like an Uber, where you wouldn't need Uber. You'd have a direct uh, sort of connection between the customer and the driver. That driver actually could be eventually um, a self-driving car. Um, what gets really interesting there is um, you could theoretically eliminate profit margins because autonomous agents don't need to make profit. Um, so it can, these things will have a lot of, uh, in, you know, obviously this is in the future a bit, but you know, this is, this is real now. Um, uh, you can do this all uh, very today and you'll see a lot of new tools coming out. But that's the world where I think you could see a billion times a billion transactions a day. If you're really uh, going into a world of, uh, of an internet for value with smart uh, agents. Um, so we shouldn't be talking about technology that replaces existing payment numbers. We should be talking about a world like the Internet of Information, where you see just exponential increases in the amount of value being transmitted. Oops. So that's what the vision's always been. And now that's like along lines of what Tesla's looking to do now. When you're going to get to machine-to-machine -machine payments, um, the Internet of Value, Interledger, these projects are already going on with Interledger and the Internet of Things. And when you see old videos like that, sometimes things are irrelevant, but videos like that are super important because that's been always their vision. You know, maybe the Codius, what was then, is has evolved and been enhanced, but that's what they're working towards. Interledger could do that now, run smart contracts outside of blockchain networks. That's why, you know, smart contracts unless DeFi is great, but once the smart contracts can move into the middleware layer, that opens up a whole new applications that you can't even fathom in the future. And those are the type of things that Tesla's going to look to do. So now, what about energy trading? How about if you had solar panels, David Schwartz's solar panels on his roof, and he could sell that leftover power to somebody coming to a charging station with their Tesla? Hopefully this sound plays. The internet is more and more about connecting things with one another and people. David and Sarah live in the same city, but don't know each other. David wants to charge his electric car using clean, renewable energy and pay as little as possible. Sarah has solar panels on the roof of her house that generate more electricity than she's consuming, and she wants to sell the leftover energy. Currently, it is impossible to connect Sarah the supplier with David the buyer. To make this happen, we started the Sophie Project a marketplace that enables consumers to search for offers on clean electricity and monetize their spare electricity. A marketplace that is transparent, fair, not controlled by a single entity exclusively, and automatically handles all the transactions. To summarize, Sophie will build a trustworthy marketplace that enables data exchange between different parties by setting the framework for connecting networks of things and enabling automatic discovery of other things, transactions between them, as well as delivery. How do we do this? 
by connecting existing technologies and IoT platforms via SOFIE specified software adapters. These adapters enable automated transactions between diverse IoT platforms and devices in a secure, transparent and highly available way. We use a variety of blockchain technologies for generating immutable audit trails, which enable quick and transparent resolution of all kinds of potential disputes. Smart contracts enabled by blockchain technologies automate the whole process. Sarah can set conditions for the sale, and David can set conditions for the purchase. To maximize Sarah's profit, she should contact as many potential buyers as possible. Sophie enables this by establishing a framework that is secure, transparent, and free for all the users. Additionally, we will run two more pilots in different areas to demonstrate the advantages of Sophie in the food supply chain and in mobile mixed reality gaming. Sophie will set an open and decentralized foundation for data and service exchanges and fourth generation business platforms. And this is part of uh, European Union Horizon 2020 and Oh, man, they're all over this uh, Interledger. It's all part of the whole thing right here. So you could see setting standards. Yeah, and Mickey, just to go with kind of the theme of, let's say you have some leftover energy from mm -hmm. solar panels or whatever it may be in the future. And, you know, simply you could just have an app that people plug into, like, you know, Airbnb, where you're like, hey, I list this place for rent. But it could be like, you're, you can stop here and use this power. Like you could have wallets integrated into a lot of these cars that already have, you know, basically a computer sitting there right in front of you and the dashboard. Um, and, you know, you think about maybe something that Codius does um, with escrowing uh, money and it could take data feeds from how much energy has been given to the car at whatever the prevailing rate is. And then it releases that payment when it's done. Um, so, I mean, it's just like a lot of things happening in the future and you know, IOT, I think we've talked about this, like the internet of things has kind of been held back a little bit. I, you know, I remember I used to intern um, with uh, Panasonic when I was like in 2015, maybe. And they do all this stuff like um, they build dashboards and cars essentially now. That's their biggest big business as opposed to having, you know, like their old appliances and all that. And they were talking about all the internet of things and how that was going to work at the company when I was there. So it was very interesting, but it seems like they need that value transfer for these things to really take off. Absolutely. And now they've done so many different proof of concepts. I mean, it's just, they chose Interledger to do all this with, I mean, um, internet of things is the future. And with that's going to come machine learning and AI. I didn't get a chance to post it today. Um, Ripple, First job description I've ever seen where they're hiring a special machine learning expert and uh, PhD data scientists. So they're really going hardcore into the whole data and machine learning. And that's where the technology is. So that, I feel like all the inf infrastructures that they built around here from Interledger Protocol, the whole suite of streaming payments to the whole Ripple Net Network and the whole pay string with the domains, those things are going to be meaningful when we're ready to move to an internet of value. It's just the regulations have held everything back. Um, energy trading, I think it's really going to be massive. Now, you and I talk, Patty, about certain business models. For example, like gaming. Um, it's just not feasible on Ethereum. Like there's certain business models, the gas fees, it's just not going to work ever um, until they change over. Now, what's your thoughts on thinking um, basically with gaming on Flare, I feel like that's going to be a key focus. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Gala is just like the first to really, uh, you know, one of the first companies that's really dipping their toes into all this. There's definitely some other gaming companies that run, um, do stuff on Ethereum and all that. And that's where Gala is coming from. But, you know, gamers aren't, you know, they're used to things happening fast. And, you know, like popular games like Call of Duty and things like that, Fortnite, the action is really fast. So they're going to want all their payments to happen quickly and they're not going to want all these fees attached i mean think about who plays games it's you know normally younger people and you know they're not going to have money to spend on these kind of fees but like there's just so much they could do with gaming like right now like a lot of the problems i think like some of these big names like madden for instance year after year they come out with basically a rehash of last year's product with minimal increases and every year i see people getting upset about it so the gamers spend all this money 
on you know all these gaming platforms and trading items in game and all that stuff but it's like time for them to be able to own some of that similar to like us with our financial assets actually having control over it so you know i think it's a big opportunity and imagine like in the future like basically a decentralized game that's like mainstream that's that can be owned by the players like you know who's to say that you couldn't invest into like a gaming franchise and have a say in who's going to be the developer on it and things like that so it's just like an entire market that is going to continually get better bigger as things get more digital so i'm really excited to see them coming on to flare especially with gala and this mirandus game that they're coming out with which is basically it's called a, it's an mmorpg which is massive multiplayer online um, role-playing game so you can think of like world of warcraft or something of that nature um, that's you know all online and you can build up trade items i know they sold banking rights in that game to some firm for like five hundred thousand dollars so i mean like you could maybe go somebody creates an area and you have to pay like you know three cents to get in they could just stream that payment to them right on the spot if you go inside that area like off your account so there's just so many different things you can do and people can make money with their hobbies, which is really cool as well. Yeah, gaming's gonna be huge. And Forte is the next one that's gonna really be, I think, come to life here. That's gonna be the marketplace and the token economy that's gonna connect to Interledger, connect to the XRP ledger. It's gonna have smart contracts. It's gonna have NFTs. Um, that's, I think there's multiple projects on hold right now because of this case. Uh, with the, uh, as Brad would say, dereliction of duty by the SEC. So it's kind of disappointing, but this can't go on that much longer. I would say like a couple more months and then, you know, to be honest, I think, you know, then Ripple could start falling behind. So we have an opportunity here within those few months to leapfrog ahead um, and things could totally change like overnight. And you're like, you're thinking, okay, Ethereum's 4,000. It's just got $500 billion market cap. XRP is not even anywhere near there. Flare is not even live. But in six months, you know, snap your fingers, the whole market could be upside down. And, you know, who would have ever thought Doge would be in, you know, the top five uh, six <laughs> months ago. So it's very unpredictable. Uh, the market's not rational, I think. You know, it's immature, not rational. Um, at least with the stock market, it's irrational, but it's based on, you know, the money printing. And it's just easy access to uh, funds but with crypto it's just all over the place you got a lot of gamblers yep exactly it is a lot of gambling which i mean personally i think kind of sucks because we have these kind of revolutionary technologies that you know people could be getting into and i think a lot are going to miss out with all the distractions that are going around which i mean like i personally just try and focus on a few things that I believe have really have long term value and sustainability like are you know, you need to look at like is a specific blockchain or like a DLT going to be able to grow into the future? Can it pivot from where it is currently and just all kinds of different things? And, you know, it's basically turned into like a sports betting market or, you know, craps uh, in Vegas, <laughs> which, you know, isn't the best, but it's kind of always happens with these you know, bubble markets, essentially. Um, eventually, I think the value is going to flow into these projects that actually have like a long term plan and like tokenomics behind them and all that. But we're just still kind of in that early day space. And, you know, I think as more institutions come in, it'll kind of start to even things out. Uh, but also, it's really easy to spin up a new project. And, you know, everybody will see like the few people that make incredible gains because they got in super early on some really like low cap coin uh but you know that's not available to most people and i think they don't they don't get that like when i have people that know nothing about like finding the other day like what if it reaches as high as bitcoin i'm just like you realize it's like they have a much much bigger supply than bitcoin so like it's just like a lot of that going on um we'll have to see how we go the rest of the year. Um, definitely if XRP can get some clarity, I think it's gonna change things up. Cause XRP has always flipped Ethereum in all these bull runs and Ethereum's up over $500 billion market cap. So XRP is gonna at least have to be $10, which I mean, that's what a lot of people are calling for, but you know, combined with the money printing and everything else that's going on uh, throughout the world, I think there's a lot more room beyond that. Oh, absolutely there is. I mean, 
XRP has always been the one that's gone last, and it, when it runs, it runs the hardest. Um, and actually, if they do have that clarity, there is a good chance that they can expand the ODL to a point where it can support a price level where you don't see a major correction. And that's something we can see with clarity because they'll have more partners, more uh, ability to um, offer lending and other type of products to support that floor price. I mean, hedging, all that stuff. That should separate. At some point, we should see XRP or the assets that are really getting a tremendous amount of utility diverge from the rest of the market because they're more utility and demand from actually using the asset than on the secondary market trading. So uh, I think we're going to see that with assets more and more in the future. BNB is kind of an example of that so far. I think Spark has that potential. Um, uh, some other assets too, even proof of stake like DOT, there's going to be a lot tied up. Um, but, uh, you know, I think we could go really much higher than $10. I think that's just very conservative, in my opinion. And I'm not a one to give price predictions. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not. So I'm very bullish right now. Very bullish. Yeah, I definitely am. It's just like all, I feel like we'll see. I mean, I think XRP can break all time high without necessarily like the lawsuit clearing up, just like the nature of this market. But yeah, for like it to really blast off, if it does get like official clarity in the US and then, you know, all the partners start coming out of the woodworks and we see ODL ramping up a lot again and things like that, that's what will give it like the staying power in the long term which is what we've been waiting for for so long, but we'll see how that goes. <laughs> yes, and exactly. And now, all right, so let's talk about the next thing on the agenda here. Yeah. So, huge announcement. PolySign gets not just a huge partnership, but they get $53 million investment from Cohen Group, which is an investment banking uh, group and you know umbrella of subsidiaries, the broker-dealer, alternative trading desks, um, alternative trading platforms, um, securities license. Um, they do mergers and acquisitions. Um, what else did they do, Patty? They pretty much they have in sales and trading research. Trading. They even have stuff to like retail. It looks like, so, I mean, they're pretty across the board. They got a wide variety of stuff, um, clearly traded. Um, they have billions of dollars, um, under management. It's, it's very big. And I mean, they even placed with this announcement, um, since it's a strategic partnership, two members of the Cohen firm mm -hmm. are now going to be on the board of directors at PolySign as well. But it, yeah, it looks like they're really trying to, um, you know, up their, their brokerage practice, uh, with the addition of like PolySign's digital banking infrastructure, and then they're going to utilize standard custody and really just create a new like institutional grade trading platform for people, which is really exciting to see. Yeah, I think they got, um, you know, it looks like they want to integrate. It's like the one thing, you know, Standard Custody has the trust charter in New York State, but that's not a full blown banking license. It does not have all the uh, regulatory requirements to do everything that they maybe want to. So it seems like to me they partnered with a very forward looking established investment bank that's looking to get market share and now the combination of that with standard custody and then polyscience platform which seems like an escrow settlement platform and um like authentication so with ripple net and all the whole liquidity network and exchange you have all these pieces coming together and being built out for a while now so um we just don't know exactly um, what standard custody's, um, you know, business model is going to be. They have an app on the i on the Apple Store, and you go to it, and it's just blank. It's corporate customers only. So are they going to be installing corporate wallets? Like when you see custody, I think like wallet a lot of times, hosted wallets. How are they going to offer services to their clients, and what type of products are they going to offer? Are they going to tokenize securities? What else are they going to put on this? PolySign platform. I think there's going to be multiple use cases for it. Um, you know, collateral. What about issuing stable coins? Um, even custing like commodities then that get tokenized. 
Yeah. And yeah. I see like, so they offer like even derivatives and stuff ah, like that to all their, mm. yeah, they have options, swaps, they do leverage, um, just like a ton of stuff. And we know that the institutions are going to need a way to do this. Uh, you know, a little speculation, but you know, I'm curious if Codius would ever play a role with PolySign in the oh, future. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Where they can run these basically like the escrow management through, um, and then these like options and swaps through the smart contracts on there. Because like the, the instant, I know we've said this before, but like the institutions need derivatives. Like that is when you're moving a ton of money around, like sometimes you're going to need to close out positions and very large ones and either lock in a profit or stop a loss by taking the other side. And, you know, derivatives are all about like, that's what they're used for. Um, or at least their initial purpose, you know, they're very speculative in the retail market. But for institutions, it's like the way for them to manage all their money. So I like to see that, that they're offering that to their customers currently. And now we're seeing like the PolySign connection, obviously, and Codius has a connection to them, too. And then Interledger and all that. So yeah. I think, uh, you know, when you say Codius, that's just the hosting protocol. But the, like those smart programs that they could just that when it could just own it's a Bitcoin wallet or an XRP wallet and it just owns the private key. It's programmed. It's just an autonomous agent, a software one, and it just executes based on different conditions and data feeds that are put in. Now, that those are like just middleware. That's what the smart oracles were all about. That's the networks they were trying to create. Because limiting the smart contracts to just the blockchain networks, that you're never going to be able to innovate into more complex things, and not everyone's going to adopt one blockchain. Even if there is these like relay bridges between some of these like smart contract blockchains that's nothing you need to be able to interoperate above all the ledgers traditional markets and what they ha use is that crypto conditions which is basically like just basically multi-sig uh multi-algorithm and uh multi-layer and it's modules it's basically smart contracts just without all the um into the blockchain basically and it runs on Codius. so that's what they say different conditions are met so when the escrow gets released different conditions happen there's not a guy sitting there at the desk um that's their secret sauce so how polysign is using that i don't know but david schwartz is excited about it um and uh interesting bringing this on also blockchain.com invested in them i thought that was an interesting uh company to invest they were part of open coalition and they also have one of the biggest um, custodial wallet providers. So, you know, what PolySign could technically open up is we all could just you see how Sologenic Dex, you could trade right on the ledger now for me. The Zum wallet, you could trade right on the Dex. I hope people are like in the community are downloading and trying it because we're going to see more and more of this with more institutions like Stay in a Custody, PolySign's platform. We're going to see a whole marketplace develop around the XRP ledger's Dex. And that's where I think they're going with a lot of this. And then you don't have to go on Coinbase. You don't have to do that. I mean, that's what's at the heart of the XRP ledger. It's a currency exchange. And it could do crypto too. So um, that's where I think they're going with everything um, eventually. And issuing of stable coins. Issuing of other assets on the ledger. Yeah. And I mean, just think about like with centralized exchanges right now, like two of the big issues is you get killed on the fees and then they don't always let you move your stuff. So like moving to the decks, it just seems like a natural progression yeah. with the decentralization of everything. Like you still maintain control without any fees, basically are extremely low fees. And I think that's what we all want. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, we can have these other firms that come in that maybe can help secure your funds and stuff like that, but in a decentralized way where they don't have control over saying you can, you know, take this money out or not. Uh, so I, I'm very excited when we can get on, get things moving on to like the XRPL decks. And then we're also going to have the fire finance decks as well. So like that one has an automated market maker and then the XRPL DEX is an order book. So that's like two different options right there. Maybe they upgrade the XRPL DEX one to an AMM in the future, but we'll have to see. They could add an object, a new object. Yeah. It would have to be um, an amendment. I think they said it would have to be an amendment um, to add it in. Uh, and it would be a new object in the XRP ledger. Uh, but there's auto bridging already now. You just need more liquidity. You just need more gateways yeah. issuing more assets. It's all set up. Um, if you went to go to like Bitstamp IOU right now of Bitcoin to XRP, there's decent liquidity. It's not that much slippage. Or XRP to GateHub USD, 
it's it's close to what the biggest changes are. I mean, if you wanted to just swap in and out, um, Casino Coin is really no liquidity, but there's like oddballs on there like Dash, Augur, Ethereum Classic, uh, Bitcoin Cash. But you got to pay five XRP to set up trust lines to them. Yeah. Uh, but we're gonna see more and more. I mean, it's good Solagenix. I was very impressed with their user interface. That thing was slick. It was, um, it was like an ex- better than a lot of the exchanges. Um, so I think some people want like a kind of a, a hosted wallet if they're using things. Because most people used to using true custody wallets when they exchange. Now, going to complete non-custodial on an AMA, you know, is simple. You just swap. But if you're doing it through an order book, you know, uh, with IOUs, I think you're going to have to go through some kind of hosted wallet on the ledger. At least KYC. Yeah. Not going to get around the KYC on the ledger, everybody. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but also, if you think about it, like, we're we're moving that, that direction eventually. So it's good that it has that capability is already built in and is ready for, you know, the inevitable, um, probably, I would say, tamp down with regulation in the future. Like, you know, I don't think it's going to stay how it is completely. We'll see how overbearing the regulation ends up being. Hopefully, you know, it's reasonable things that can be accomplished and won't, you know, hurt innovation but we're gonna have to see on that for sure i don't have a ton of faith but you know keeping an open mind there <laughs> yeah let's we'll see if we got any questions here the question yeah. always come on later is polysign related to matic in any way no not that i know they don't not that i'm aware of that they don't really fit in at all together um tessa closed at 589 i thought that was funny <laughs> um Elon pumps the <laughs> coins and he says that's work, working with them. He's not saying, listen, Elon's not going to work with crypt, just one cryptocurrency. Like, yeah. let's be real here, all right? Like, drop the Twitter. Like, the, in five years from now, you're going to look back and be like, what were we thinking, you know? I mean, he's putting on the balance sheet as a hedge. The, to accept just Bitcoin for Tesla, that's cool, but that's not really anything that special. Nobody's really using Bitcoin as a payment anyway. So how much were they really getting using it for? Not that much. It's the applications and things that he could do with crypto in the future. You know, you can move value and data. And these cars are autonomous cars. They're going to drive by themselves. They're going to have their own digital wallets built in, their own identities. They're going to be able to pay for things when they park. They're going to be able to pay for energy when they pull up for electric. Like that's where we're going in the future. That's what I think he's looking for. And that opens up all new business models. That's, I think, where if I was him, where I would be looking, you know, to jump into that, you know, maybe put some type of, um, uh, you know, DAP store or something inside of the Teslas that opens it up to decentralized applications, you know, things like that. Um, Or some kind of rewards where built into um, Teslas, like there's different things he could do as the applications are built, you know. Yeah, I mean, like when you think about the, you know, the long, long term future in regards to automobiles and autonomous vehicles, Mm -hmm. like it's not going to I don't I really doubt that we're going to have a, you know, system of transportation where half the people are driving cars and the other half are, you know, in autonomous vehicles. I think there's a lot of issues there, like. If they're going to fully deploy autonomous vehicles, they all need to be able to communicate with each other to prevent like any kind of crashes and stuff. Like it's a lot more risky to have that going on when you have human drivers driving on old vehicles that don't have any technology in them versus, you know, the newer ones that have like this, you know, keeps you straight in a lane and all that different stuff and communicate with each other. So, you know, long term future, it's like, you know, you don't own a car, but you can on demand call and you know, maybe it's Uber doing it, maybe it's some other company, maybe it's a legacy um, car manufacturer, but like you just call it up, it comes by, you could have a thing that you tap with your phone, it pays it, drops you off, whatever, like all that stuff can be done in the future. But you know, it's kind of a, it's definitely a process to get there. (laughs) Yeah. And the streaming payments is going to be huge. Streaming payments with data, that's going to just, the way the internet um, grew exponentially the way money starts moving frictionlessly um, in that streaming way, it's just going to exponentially grow the amount of um, economic activity there is. Now we just need the SEC to get off their ass and just allow capital formation to develop. Like they should just dissolve the SEC. Like 
and allow capital formation because people can't invest in private equities and other projects. It's just there's no access. Um, and with the wages going nowhere, I don't know if people saw inflation today. Uh, U.S. car prices went up 10 percent. I think it was in the last few months. That's just absurd. 10 percent, Patty. Yeah, my brother actually was what? looking at some new cars, and he said the one that he was looking at about a month or two ago went up 5K. That's He's like, yeah, I'm not getting it anymore. And also just like housing prices, cost of lumber, food's going up. I, I noticed I went and bought ice cream the other day, and it was like $7 for a quart for some Mayfield. And normally it used to be like five, literally six months ago. So, you know, inflation starting to hit as much as the, you know, the Fed and the mainstream media want to hide it, um, you know, whether it be an energy or just like random events happening, um, you know, it's coming when you print money this much, you can't stop it forever. And with the economy starting to open back up more and more, uh, you know, once the velocity of money starts to pick up, which interestingly enough, if you go to the Fed's website, you can see that within the past couple of months, we've had a bump up in the velocity of money from like basically a you know free fall for the past year or so and all of a sudden inflation is hitting and it was just a small move up so like if we start seeing larger and larger moves up to getting the money velocity back to normal um you know we're gonna see some massive inflation and whether that you know you would think that that's gonna drive people more and more into cryptos in the long term but maybe we have some kind of credit freeze that happens and you know, stock market crashes and cryptos are still very correlated with it. And in a crisis, cash is king in the short run, which I think still is going to hold true. But cryptos have a much greater ability to bounce back from any like market ca catastrophe at this point, um, just because you can move money so much quicker and get it around. There's a lot more, you know, ability to, I guess, do capital formation through new innovations and all kinds of stuff than the traditional system, which is, you know, generally been much slower. Uh, but we'll have to see how it goes. We're definitely, you know, getting into the twilight zone here with the traditional markets. And, you know, even with cryptos, you know, I don't see it stopping. Like they can't stop the printer at this point. That would just kill everything. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Um, and now yeah. to add to that investment thing, um, it's got to be said. These are their own financial products. The key is to get these institutions regulated into DeFi. Mm -hmm. Like that's the push right now. I'm seeing it from Mataco, um, multiple copper, multiple different custodians now all of a sudden transitioning from, oh, I'm just holding uh, cold storage private keys in a multi-sig uh, hardware wallet. Now it's like they need to be service providers. They need to integrate with these uh, public blockchains and the the interface with the dApps. So that's a whole new, you know, what custodians are turning it to their service providers. And they're gonna have to provide those services for the corporate clients, the institutional and others. And then it's like, at some point here, um, retail is gonna mess, the masses are gonna need that same type of interface, but they're not gonna be able to do like what we're doing, where we're gonna connect, you know, uh, MetaMask like Flare wallet, but a Flare version or Interledger with Flare Finance, with, you know, Probity, and we're gonna do it right there. Regular mass, the masses are not gonna do that. They need PayPal to just make a nice little easy app, but then PayPal links in to the, say, whatever it is, Flare, um, integration into the network and uses those DeFi primitives, those protocols, and extracts the yield, and then they build their little model on top, they take their little cut, and they offer the yield to their customers. I think that's like where we're headed here. And then you have the side of the corporate and institutionals who are going to want to get in. And that's going to come in, like, I think there's going to be floodgates there. Um, for the first one that could do it in a regulated way, safely and securely, that's where I think probity and trust line are very conservative yields, as we all saw. You know, they're not going to like jump up and down about, you know, two, three percent yield. But I think they're geared for that type of uh, traditional markets. What do you think about that, Patty? Just yeah, like and I, looking at that. Retail's not going to have enough money to be sitting here and doing all these loans. So, like, it's a perfect place for institutions to get in that want to be less risky and, you know, still earn yield because you can't earn yield anywhere else right now. So, like, having something on trust line on an institutional grade blockchain network, like the Flare Network's aiming to be, 
um, you know, provides a perfect opportunity for, you know, institutions to start dipping their toes in. Um, so, I mean, I think it's a big deal. I know it's like to us, it's like, oh yeah, like I could get like two to 5% yields, like, so what? But I mean, like eventually I don't think crypto is going to have, you know, ridiculous yields forever. Um, eventually like as the markets mature and more money comes in, it's going to start like stabilizing and, you know, we're going to see more like realistic numbers. Now I think it can be much higher than the current economy, which I mean, is in the gutter basically, especially when it comes to interest rates. So trust line is just very good option. It gets like, you know, liquidity out there, like doing loans yeah. helps. Sorry. What was that? Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm oh, okay. Yeah. I would say like, loans help build the economy like you know if everybody had to buy something with just the money they had it would probably slow down like advancement of an economy like there's a reason why we have a we're supposed to have a little bit of inflation but not like increasing you know the amount of the money supply by trillions in a single year you know having a little inflation is good it gives people an incentive to use their money which pushes an economy forward which also you know, Flare has that inflation mechanism, which is going to make people wanting to use their Spark tokens and, you know, put them to work instead of just holding them, which, you know, ultimately will lock up an economy. And make no mistake, Flare Network is its own little economy that's going to grow over time as more value gets brought on. So, like, the inflation mechanism is a big deal. It's just, like, when it gets, you know, basically the current systems in Haywire, you know, with them just constantly printing, you know, they have to buy, you know, bad debt off of firms like man arena has been talking about how they're purchasing 40 billion dollars worth of mbs's which is mortgage-backed securities all that stuff from the last crisis uh daily so you know that's just not a sustainable method but at least with flare the inflation is being delivered directly to like the citizens of the network rather than just going into all this like crap debt and products or you know failing companies at this point exactly and um I got a nice little video clip for just a reminder that it's not just um, Patty and I hyping this up. This is coming from the CEO right here. Point of that or point of the distribution characteristics and, and the length of it is firstly to reduce uh, you know, when you when you distribute a token, you may not get the buy in of everyone. And so it's to reduce the impact of liquidity on day one. But uh, importantly, it's also to massively increase uh, the yield that um, someone that holds the token and wishes to participate in the network can achieve. And uh, uh, importantly, it's also to massively increase uh, the yield that um, someone that holds the token and wishes to participate in the network can achieve. And I'll explain that. So the way we uh, have mining, let's say, although we don't really call it mining on Flare, uh, we have this Oracle system. And the Oracle system is the inflation uh, element of the system. So ultimately, uh, Spark holders, FLR holders, uh, they contribute votes. And in fact, we just published uh, a, a, an Oracle article today um, that breaks this down. But in, in brief, people vote for a price. Uh, they either vote for their own price or they vote, they delegate their votes to another data provider. Uh, so a price, and let's call that price, you know, to start with, that's the Flare XRP price. Uh, and that's an important price because that dictates the amount of collateral that is held against the FXRP contract, um, such that uh, XRP exists in a safe manner on Flare. Um, and so the Oracle system is in some ways the kind of the heart of Flare, uh, because um, FBA style networks, they don't require um, mining, they don't require uh, block rewards. So there isn't actually, a, uh, there, there hasn't traditionally been a necessity for inflation, but we wished for the Flare asset Spark to have um, a, a sort of a strong utility, which is the creation and provision of data, and then separately the, the use as collateral to transport value from other networks to Flare. Uh, so to try and break this down. So did everyone catch that and understand the use case of Spark, like out the gate, what it is? Um, collateral is its use case, and it comes with yield. Now, that's something XRP just doesn't have, and these other assets don't have. So they built something very special here, um, 
and you don't need to use Spark in all these other applications. Typically when a network spins up, you have the native token and you gotta use it to secure the network. It's gotta get used in the applications. With Flare getting spun up, it has the advantage of having these F assets, which are already established cryptos in the top 10 with longtime holders who could bring their value over, unlock it and use it in the applications so that you can use Spark in them, but Spark's main use case is to be staked in the F asset collateral system. Now, staking in the F asset collateral system is not the same as staking in proof of stake. The delegating of your FTSO vote, that's more along the lines of staking um, because you would get just daily rewards for doing that uh, delegating of the vote at no risk. Now, with staking with an agent, that, you know, is not no risk. Um, it depends on the agent you're dealing with. It could be your exchange, you know, it could be standard custody. We don't know. Um, I think we'll have plenty of options, but the delegating of the vote and being able to use that spark simultaneously um, is going to deter people from selling it. You know, you're going to have to make a decision and say, I'm giving up these two yield streams to sell it. And what am I getting for that? Am I going to be able to make that future cash flow up? Right, Patty? Yeah, exactly. Future I mean, time, time value of money. Yeah, so, you know, what is what is your opportunity cost? Like, you know, if you're going to exit Spark, you know, you're you're going to sell out at a price, but you're also going to sell out that future cash flow. And if you move into an asset that no longer is natively interest bearing, um, then it's going to need to increase by a good amount, um, you know, just via price appreciation for you to continue like to be making the same that you would. So like, I mean, to me, like the Spark token is next gen. Like once this launches, I don't know how other networks are going to compete unless they're going to make, you know, multiple yield streams, essentially at least one built into the asset automatically that you that is risk free. You don't have to give up your Spark or anything like that to delegate to a signal provider. It's a detachable vote. Like this is the future of programmable money. Yes. And, you know, once people see that you can earn, let's see, via the FTSO risk-free, and then there's going to be tons of DeFi options where you can actually place the coin and you can earn on a variety of different risk profiles. I mean, that's just a massive opportunity. You know, cash right now, like the US dollar, any other fiat, you can't even earn interest on it. So now we're bringing this new asset that's probably going to appreciate in price due to the fact that its main use case is collateral that also has built in yield. I mean, it's just like it's probably it's the best thing I've ever heard of personally, like as far as we're looking at for a financial opportunity, not financial advice, but like very, very excited about that aspect. And, you know, also, while it's not built in the F assets, at least in the short run, I'd say one to two years are going to be having a lot of spark delivered to all the F assets that are minted on the system. So that's one yield form. And then you can also go and use that asset somewhere else. And more than likely the signal providers are probably going to pay for you to delegate your F asset vote to them so that they can increase their voting power. So it's possible that the F assets have three yield streams. Now, maybe with you delegating to a signal provider, it's more, you know, faced around like a product that they could offer you or something like that. But, you know, it also could be, um, you know, some form of value, like in a cryptocurrency or cash or whatever. So, like, right off the bat, if you have Spark in an F asset, that's five ways to earn right there, just, just from the get-go, essentially. And, I mean, that's huge. It's just absolutely huge. These assets, like, you're getting this yield on a daily basis. We all know at this point, uh, you know, compounding yield daily you know, increases what you have at an exponential rate compared to, you know, traditional methods of paying out like, you know, twice a year, once a year, maybe if you're lucky once every 12 months, um, you're increasing that rate so much more and it, you know, builds capital, it builds wealth way quicker. Um, and I just like, you know, things are going to have to, you know, current cryptos are going to have to adjust to compete with that. And then you blend in, you know, we're going to have a decentralized Oracle on the network. Also, the transactions per second are going to be off the charts and the gas fees are going to be extremely low compared to the pr predominant, uh, you know, smart contract net platform, which is Ethereum. Mm -hmm. So they're just there's just so much to be excited about here. <laughs> I got another one for you. This one we won't yeah. talk about too much. The <clears throat> excuse me, the actual distribution of the supply 
there's three ways it's getting distributed, right? Well, four, really. There's the initial 15% that's going of an air of an airdrop um, to the XRP community holders who are holding Spark, who are holding XRP in December, right? Now that's one. Now the FTSO is distributing the inflation re rewards. It that's going to the participants who have the most interest in the network. They're the most motivated. And then the third way Spark is being distributed is out of the general rewards pool. Now that's part of the hundred billion. It's not extra. That's going to those who mint F assets on the network, right? Yeah. Now you have every month three percent of um, uh, the Your total Spark allocation, the Spark yeah. allocation getting released to those XRP holders from a snapshot. So the, the the fair distribution of the token over periods of time to the right people, the right stakeholders, is going to have an impact and it's just going to drive, um, it's going to have less and less manipulation because those who don't participate or act maliciously, they, there's no way they could even, um, you know, have any impact on the network because those who do participate are just going to keep, you know, accumulating. And it's, it's fairly distributed. Look at how Ripple distributed. Has that fairly? How's Bitcoin distributed? Only miners get it. Ethereum, only miners get it. Even some of these big proof of stake networks, only the big stake, the big validators get it. Spark's getting distributed evenly as pretty much any network I've ever seen. Um, and it's going to get rid of all the weak hands too in the beginning. So that'll be nice. So yeah. we'll get a chance just to sell out. I don't know if you're going to be able to sell your whole allocation. You might. If that is, I mean, I'll look and see if some people are selling their whole thing. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, I mean, with smart contracts, it's probably possible to make some kind of IOU that, you know, you can release to them. I'm sure somebody will have to, you know, yeah, build out some contract. functionality. Yeah, somebody could probably build out that functionality, a dev that makes it easy for you to do. And mm -hmm. there could be a little market for that. But yeah, it's like, you know, the the Flare team's actually kind of giving a blessing to people by doing it, this like dispersed airdrop where it's happening over a three year period. Because let's say you sell your 15% initially, you sell for a couple more months, and then you realize like, wow, this is actually a pretty good network. Now you're going to have people that are sitting there continuously getting an airdrop over time that have more and more time to decide that they actually want to participate in that based on like how it's doing. So like, I mean, a lot of people are like, oh, give it all to us now. Like you're not doing, you know, you're not doing anything good for us. And I, I highly disagree with that statement. Um, what they're doing is going to be beneficial to the network as a whole and on the individual level. So I just really like the foresight. And also like, you know, this is going to be a little speculation from me, but if this airdrop goes very well and the Flare Network's able to bootstrap value and liquidity and, you know, a reasonable amount of, amount of time and things are going smoothly, like think about, all the future dApps that are going to be built on Flare Network. We already have Flare Finance is going to do an airdrop with, for Spark holders. And if Spark's the native asset that does the voting for new projects and things like that, then I could see them wanting to airdrop to Spark holders. So, you know, there's a possibility um, that we see more airdrops on top of the Flare Finance one in the future for Spark holders, especially because it avoids the security issue, like, you know, right off the bat. And then also it gives people, you know, access to participate so they can do more of these like prolonged airdrops in the future. It's just a lot of new things that they're implementing here that could potentially change the game um, for all these blockchains going forward. All right. I'm going to give a poll to everybody. How many, how much Spark is going to be released from the Flare Time Series Oracle every day? How much do you think is going to get released? Just put it in. How much do you think is released daily? From the FTSO. Yeah, don't say Patty. Just how much do you I'm think not gonna say, yeah. is going to be released <laughs> daily, every day starting on day one? How much rewards do you think it generates every day? It does the same amount every day. How much do you think it's going to be? And the circulating supply is going to be around, you know, five to eight billion with with the uh, Flare team having around, uh, you know, three or so, it's only going to really be about five on this, on the uh, circulating. Uh... All right. So it looks like we got a couple people that have it right. Um, 
So it's a little over 27 million Spark delivered daily for six months um, before any change can happen. Um, and that's being delivered through the FTSO. Every day, you can earn that risk-free. All you have to do, delegate your Spark to a signal provider. It'll continually delegate with them. You don't have to every day change up and re-delegate to people. So, you know, that's just going to be a passive income stream coming in. You know, you could sit there and diversify who you're providing your FTSO detachable vote to and, you know, just let it ride and let that spark come in. And then you'll have the F asset system to go and put your spark in as collateral. You can mint F assets. You're going to have the daily yield there. Just so many different streams coming in. And that's 27 million daily. I mean, that's huge. And then you're going to have the F asset system doing somewhere from probably 20 to 40 million daily as well. Um, but yeah. <laughs> yep. And so this is after six months, um, there'll be a governance vote. So it's 833 million per month, right? Now, initially, then you have the F assets. So I hope this, this is where I think it's the most confusing for anyone who first comes into the Flare ecosystem. And if you have to explain it to people, to friends and family, other people, that there's this separate rewards pool thing going on that I just call them escrows. The, it's an escrow, right? That algorithmically releases uh, rewards to anyone who brings over their XRP, their Litecoin, their XLM, their Doge. They get rewarded daily with Spark. Now, um, how much do you think that's gonna come out uh, to be daily? Per day, how much spark is coming out of the F assets general rewards pool? Give a little guess. Come on. I kind of just if said you it too. <laughs> FXRP over. How much spark is being released from the general rewards pool every day? Start that will slowly go down on day one. Wait, is my chat delayed? Uh no, I think uh Nope, nobody wants to answer. <laughs> I guess you guys don't want 40 million spark. I don't know. It's just like, I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's 40 million. If it's Yeah, 20 there million, we go. It's going to be around 20 to 40 million. Yeah, King Axron's got it, depending on the claimed amount of spark. Exactly. Yeah, that's definitely going to be the deciding factor. Nice thing. We're going to know that June 11th is the last day to claim your spark. So if you haven't done that and you have a self custody friendly reminder, Definitely want to go do that <laughs> mm -hmm. So I'm if doing you're this, interested. <laughs> I'm doing this for a reason because when you can't calculate APY for how you're going to receive these things. So I think it's best just to understand what the daily amount's going to be and then it'll be broken down um, on participation. So it'll be the dollar value of your FXRP versus everyone else's um, Doge, Litecoin, no, not Litecoin, Doge and XLM, um, and what percentile you fall in. So if you have 100,000 FXRP on there and there is only a million um, FXRP minted, you would then get 10% of that 40 million. So, I mean, I'm not saying it's going to be that high, but those first few days, there's, there's the opportunity to rack up some uh some big amounts of spark and then everyone comes piling in yeah so, but i just also though it's possible that the big corporates and ones who did hold a lot of xrp are all up in this too so um we do have to remember that yeah that is the one big unknown for me but also like you got to think if you have that much xrp where it would have a great effect so i'm saying like 25 million xrp or more you're you're already extremely wealthy, so no, you know I. Work. That's yeah, but I wouldn't do. put it. I wouldn't put it all at once. Um, you know, I would kind of layer in if I had that much. Like, you know, going through and minting all that at once seems a little risky to me. But, um, you know, I just don't see them. You know, plopping in twenty million XRP into the F asset system on day one. Yeah, but what know? if? What if? All right, let's think about it like this. What if they have a. Um, like a stay under custody or like a Cohen, like there's going to be these um, tech custod crypto custodians, crypto banks that are going to offer services and then they'll, um, you know, insure them or they'll take the risk and, you know, they're just using their assets. So I think, you know, 
The point here is just getting access to it. Um, you know, why would you not? I mean, you know, I just think the exchange is going to offer a lot. Like people trust, people are trusting Coinbase right now by putting their ETH staked, and ETH 2.0 doesn't even exist yet, and they're putting it in there for two years. So, yeah, let's think just... about just for a second. All right, and they're not even earning anything. I don't think. It's very low. It's really low APY. I some one of my friends just told me that they did that, and I was like, "Wait, you have it locked up for two years? Are you?" Yeah, definitely don't. <laughs> I was do like, "I can't believe so. people are doing that." <laughs> this Coinbase probably just taking in you doing who knows whatever with it. <laughs> like I like crypto because my assets aren't locked up for a long yeah. time. Like I can't imagine locking any asset asset up for two years. It already kills me that with a four hundred one k you have to keep it in there. I know that's the whole point, but like. That's just shocking that people will want to do that with Ethereum. And who knows how that is going to turn out. I mean, that is a huge undertaking for them to move to proof of stake and keep everything running smoothly the entire time. All along the way, they have all these like really good projects between like Flare, Polkadot, um, Cardano that are all nipping at the heels trying to get in there. Um, so Something we'll see how that turns. To replace, yeah. Something's going to need to replace ETH um, on the network, I think, because... It's going to be any application has to compete with that those that proof of stake APY. If they're not offering more than that proof of stake, then the you know proof of stake system is, then people are just going to put their ETH in there. But then you lose your ETH, right? So yeah, um, I, it's it's going to be tough. I don't know. Um, and if they would think that they're going to put on you know billions and trillions of dollars in security tokens and bonds and all that. If that, if they don't have enough value staked, then the attack vectors start coming in, start putting trillions of dollars in bonds. Proof of stake is going to be efficient. It's only a matter of time. The, econ the economists and the analysts from these big banks, they can say this is not capital efficient. We're locking this all up and we're not even, you know, we're just securing the network. Well, we can't do anything else with it. You know, um, that's what's great about the F assets and spark because you could utilize them and you still have this yield and you don't have no vesting periods no bond unbonding periods none of that and um after listening to a few of hugo's things the signal providers are i think a really interesting uh ecosystem and marketplace is going to develop around there patty what do you think like um what can that turn into beyond just that yeah so you know i was thinking about this today um our buddy Banjo Samurai interviewed uh, Tim Rowley, who, you know, I've been seeing he's been posting stuff um, is going to be working with FTSO AU. And they kind of talked about this. How do you how are you going to incentivize people in the long term to stay with a signal provider? And I mean, they're probably going to need to have additional product offerings and stuff that they can give at discounts or give away for free. Um, like, you know, auto com or auto delegating newly earned spark would be one of them. I can think of right off the bat. That's going to be really important. And people choosing a signal provider, if they can provide some script that does that for you. Um, but yeah, I, I, they definitely are going to have to come up with different ways to entice people to come over to their service. And we'll have to see like who ends up being some of the better signal providers and We'll probably see like you know a you know a group of ones that are more efficient and better at analyzing the data and providing that. Um, but like gaining voting power is also a big part of earning the rewards, which is ultimately what's going to keep people with them in the long run. Olga's glossary, wow! All right, so I'm on FTSO.UK right now. Um, they're one of the signal providers. You could all see that. Look at that, Patty. There's a nice little glossary. Yeah. Um, we could download that too. Oh, dang, yeah. I'll download it afterwards. Um, oh, I actually want to address a couple. Um, oh, yeah, thanks thanks to all you guys for the super chats. Very nice. Sevorg, I like your comment. So if XRP reaches $10 before Flare launch, many will sell and lose the opportunity to mint FXRP for the oh, daily rewards, unfortunately. I disagree. Well, no, oh. I wait, wait. So I, I, I agree with him. People are going to like X $10 is the XRP number to sell but. from what I can tell across the community. So if you think of it this way, 
if you don't sell your XRP at ten dollars and it's there and you can put it into the Flare network, you now have a lot larger value, which means you're going to be getting more rewards than you would have before if XRP was still, you know, let's say two dollars at launch. Like that's five X more capital. And these rewards are all based on how much capital you have minted in F assets. And also, if you think about it, the people that are selling at ten dollars, like who are they selling to? Who's going to be buying XRP at ten dollars? Are those people likely to come in and mint F assets? So it could even reduce, you know, how many people are actually going to do it. There may have been people that were going to mint F assets, but ultimately sold it and aren't going to do it. So that gives you an opportunity to in the beginning. I think we'll have to see, but you know, I think that would be very good for earning rewards and more of them. I definitely hope the price is higher. Yeah, you're going to pay more dollar value for that creation fee. But if you guys watched any of the videos we did recently on the earnings potential, then you know that creation fee could very well be negligible um, in the end of it. Not financial advice on that either, obviously, but like, <laughs> well, um, here's my that's what we're looking at. <laughs> I think that if it gets to something like 10 bucks, I think there's going to be many people that are going to take um, a small profits, 10 to 15%. But yeah. they're going to have so much of value. It's the dollar value. They're going to be more likely to mint and bring it over because now they're like, all right, let me put this value to work. Um, I don't think everyone's selling out at ten dollars. I mean, you're... well, I'm not not completely, but they will. People will be selling some. I mean, if you think like blockchain, yeah, a little bit, probably, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. it depends on the situation. If Ripple just made it through the lawsuit and we have clarity and there with a big marketing push of ten dollars. I am not. That would be like just uh, imagine feeling like, you know, knowing that they're about to get full. They have full clarity. They've just hired hundreds of people. Um, Flare's going live. PolySign's live. Standard Custody's is up. Interledger's going. RippleNet's ready to go. They're testing CBDCs. Um, we have FXRP going. And we have full clarity. Um, I'm not selling 10 bucks. I would take profits. But I think the... I don't... Like, I love blockchain backer. I really do. With technical analysis in the short term and everything. But at one point, this market's going to change. And you're going to see it move away from that speculative thing. And it's actually use cases. Like, I think Ripple will have more an impact. Lending, you know. And what, what use cases will stand of custody bring out, you know. Yeah, well, I'll throw in this caveat, Mickey. Not, not everybody's you, though, and sees all this. So you got to, like... There's a lot of people that own XRP that know nothing about anything that's going on. They just bought it because they wanted to buy some cryptos and they probably saw it was cheap. So, I mean, there's a ton of people like that out there that will sell, not knowing any of this is going on. I mean, personally, I don't think Flair has seen very much attention at all uh, up to this point. Like, it's, you know, a small amount of people and even within the XRP community that know about it. So... You know, we'll see how that goes. Like, I mean, I'm more excited to mint if XRP price is higher. So, you know, like I was saying earlier, you're going to have a larger share of the rewards, which is ultimately what you want. But um, yeah, we'll have to see how that goes. I also kind of think that people are going to be more scared to yes. put their XRP into the F asset system if it's a higher dollar, because now that they ha they've had a taste of that, you know, it'd be like, what, seven or eight X from where we're at right now. Uh, I think they're going to be more scared to relinquish their XRP if it goes higher, which just means more opportunity for us. Um, but yeah, that's yeah. kind of my opinion on it right now. Mm -hmm. We'll see how that goes when we get live. And one of the network and you, you get this token that's getting airdropped to you and you're going to be able to earn XRP with that and XLM, like top crypto assets <laughs> and yeah. more smart. It's just unheard of. Like the market's eventually going to catch on to that. Like, I know on the surface, oh, we got to pay 5% for this. But that 5% is going to those people who are staking their spark. So I'm good with the 5%. Um, and if you waited, you could just be on Flare X and buy uh, FXRP with your uh, spark. I don't think that much is going to be redeemed. I think a lot of it's going to stay there for a long time. That's why, when they, that's why Hugo said we want to unlock this value. And the more Bitcoin you get on there on Litecoin, the less energy intensive... Than the transactions and the network congestion is on the Bitcoin network. So, um, Doge too. So, two assets that um, Elon was pushing, because Bitcoin is going to be coming. That will be the probably the first governance vote. Um, and just one more time, I'm going to bring this up. Governance-wise, when the network goes live, there's no unilateral decisions. It's just everyone votes by governance. 
Flair team can't do anything. So don't say, oh, I hope they bring over XDC. Or I hope they bring over Cardano. Well, you know what? Uh, it's now about community governance and discuss it with the community and, you know, talk to the foundation. They're going to come out soon and propose why. Why is it good for the network? Um, and, you know, ERC-20s, I think, going to be very difficult. Um, but Bitcoin's definitely the next one. And I could see, like, a, a Bitcoin cash even uh, come over, too. Yeah. What um, assets do you think? What do you think would be another F asset? I mean, what'd you say? Bitcoin? Uh, did you say Bitcoin cash? Yeah, but they kind of work on some kind of smart contracts, but they have a lot of value and it's... They have a lot of value. I just think any of these too. legacy blockchains, uh, Roger, what is Roger Bear? Z- he has the XRP connections. Yeah, Zcash is another one. Yeah. Um, Dash? Ma- maybe Monero in the no, future? I don't no, think you don't think near so. Monero. They won't go near that. Well, we get to decide, right? <laughs> that, no, we get to decide, but I don't think that <laughs> the foundation would recommend it, and I don't think that people would go for that. I, I just don't think that that would make it on. Um, you know, it has to get proposed, and then it has to hit, like, a threshold, um, and then to go to a vote. Um, yeah. You know, a certain amount of people have to vote for it, um, and that. But um, I don't think we need too many more. Um I could see Cardano coming over, ADA. It depends how long they take to get their stuff up. Because right now you can't do much with ADA in any smart contracts, really, right? Yeah, and I mean, they did have that vote already. And it was like unanimously like 90% voted yes on Cardano. So I'm curious if that's Mm. something that they'll, uh, you know, put out there closer to launch that they're going to integrate Cardano beforehand. We'll have to see, but it, I mean, since they've mentioned already, it seems like it could definitely be something, if it's not before launch, be put up to a vote after. I think there's a lot of overlap in XRP holders holding uh, holding Cardano, holding ADA. Yeah, I literally only found yeah. out about it from the XRP community like yeah. a couple of years ago. <laughs> That's one thing I regret, not buying Cardano and just staking it there. That's one yeah. that I did miss. Um but it's, it, was, it. <laughs> it was a very slow moving part. I knew it was going to take years to develop. So I just, you know, logically, it was like, all right, XRP is ready to go um, so far ahead of like what Cardano is doing. You know, what they're doing is great. It's a different approach. But value wise, if there was clarity, XRP use case and just out there should be way above Cardano. Um, you know, it, Cardano it doesn't be right really now. belong anywhere up there. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, Polkadot's going to be, if everyone knows there, Polkadot's Web3, they're going to have ties in with um, Flare. They have a good relationship. And Cosmos, too. And Avalanche. Like, those three blockchains, I think, are that friendly. Um, I know. Yeah, I mean, Avalanche. Flare specifically mentions Polkadot and Cosmos in the white paper um, for some interoperability use mm-hmm. cases between Flare Network and Polka- Polkadot and Cosmos. Um, they have, like, a more you know, a more difficult way of getting assets onto their network uh, as they require, like, um, basically, like, correspondence with the other one. So, like, both sides have to do some work as opposed to Flare can just integrate into any blockchain without, like, Mm -hmm. any say from the other blockchain, which they could basically be kind of the pathway to propagate more assets onto Polkadot Um, and Cosmos, which would only, you know, free up more value movement for sure. All right, I got to throw in something there. Um, yeah, yeah. The integration that they're doing currently um, is based on these legacy blockchains, the way they're doing yeah. it. If they were going to integrate with something like Cosmos, I believe they're going to work with Agoric. And, you know, it might be an easier transition because if the smart contracts communicate, like, all right, Binance Smart Chain might be an easy one for um, Flare to integrate with. And I just thought of that because they're both EVM-based right? That might be a more logical one um, to get projects over there from there to over to Flare than Ethereum. Like, I don't think ETH's coming over. Like, well, I'm not voting for that. Um, But Cosmos and Polkadot, I think they could do fairly easy. Just, I don't know if they'll have to do as much of that integration um, uh, the way they have to with Litecoin and um, XRP Ledger. Because there are smart contracts on those other networks. There's just, you can't lock them up um, on Bitcoin or on XRP Ledger. And escrow, you know, you can't then pull it out when you want. It's an escrow and it's set for a certain thing. So um, uh, 
I think Agoric's going to have a uh, smart contract interoperability using like da, dra, da, JavaScript object oriented uh, programming. So that's exciting. Um, well, we're about an hour and 20 minutes into this. <laughs> Do you have anything else you want to talk about? Or? Um, um, doesn't seem like too many people are excited about the Polystein thing. Like, I saw DAI's thing, and he was trying to look for all connections. But um, I just think that's such a huge part of what's being built um, on the back end. When it comes time and they get clarity... Um, it, it, they're just going to be able to go right into the capital markets. Um, I mean, what about PolySign doing a SPAC? Because like, um, that's what they specialize in, um, Cohen. What do you think? Yeah, Cohen does SPACs. I mean, it's totally possible for went? sure. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, it's just, it seems like they're ramping up now. Like, Ripple's ramping up, we can yeah. tell. And now PolySign rarely comes out with anything. And they drop two announcements that are related to them yeah. within like a week of each other. So, I mean, I just look at it as a positive step and, you know, kind of merging the institutional with the retail on the crypto. Uh, and it has me very excited for when that that whole like firm can like go live and are not necessarily go live, but we can know about it because we all know how excited uh, David Schwartz is about it. And then like Arthur Brito, obviously one of the co-founders of the XRP ledger are behind it. So you got some really good minds there. BNY Mellon, like, you know, one of the most established banks in the entire world um, working with, you know, into that. So, yeah. Yeah. I think backed um, is part of that whole thing too. That's just speculation. Um, but I think so. I think they're definitely one of the secret partners. Just so when you look at their, um, I got to look at it right here. Where is it? Uh, come on. They use the words. Where is it? Tell me they changed it. <laughs> Tell me they don't use it anymore. They used to do on demand. Where is it? Uh, I think it's under, maybe it's under trading, I think. I don't know, maybe they stopped using those words. Do they do on demand anymore? No? I guess one they did now. And now they use unlock the value of digital assets. Come on. Like that's, you know, it was on, it was on Fire. demand. And then it was, <laughs> then they were using all the other ones. Like they're either taunting them. Seriously. Um, let's see. I could have sworn it said right here. It was on demand. It said, unless it's, it's gotta be in this thing. Nah, I guess they changed it. Yeah, they changed it a little, but um, I thought it was still pretty good. I mean, just the fact that they're saying that. Does anyone got any other questions? Is there anything up out there? Um, JQ asked which FTSO provider do you guys think will have the most support all, off the gate? Um, I definitely think PAC will be one of them since they're doing a really interesting thing where they're basically doing like uh, the data is being provided, you know, decentralized via all their nodes that they have out there um, and then, you know, being sent into the FTSO. So that's really interesting. Uh, I'd say like Bitrue's one, a bunch of XRP holders already use Bitrue. And then uh, Toho Labs, possibly. Um, we'll see if Dell Chain maybe acts as a signal provider. Uh, I definitely think like any established firm, probably, yeah, since is. they have a name brand. Um, but we'll just have to see. On demand liquidity. Come on. Like, yeah. <laughs> unlocking value, on demand liquidity, and then you're do something. Yeah, this... Did you want to share your screen? I don't oh, know I'm if you're trying it? to show. No. no. Oh. Here we go. On demand liquidity. Everyone sees this? This is back. No. Uh, oh, there we go. Yep. Good to yeah. go. On demand. And then we go down here. They just happen to say. Where is it? Ready to unlock the value of your digital assets. 
Yeah, and they're doing all kinds of stuff with rewards points and trying to integrate that and make them like tradable and usable. So they got, they got an interesting value. thing. I don't know. I mean, is that a coincidence? But I mean, it's like the first thing that comes up here on Flare. <laughs> so. Yeah, they're too quiet. They outsourced everything, and that's BNY Mellon. So um, I don't think it's going to be investable, PolySign or Codius. Everyone keeps asking me about Codius. Um, but, yeah, I would keep an eye on Gala and any other uh, things that are coming out. Stack your Spark and get Y Flare. That's the, that's the one thing. And Y Fin. <laughs> and, then, and then to get Y Fin, yes. That, mm -hmm. you know, that's the other thing is, you know, bringing your FXRP on there. Um, gives you another asset to then go and utilize to earn YFIN. There's literally 11,000. There's only 4,000 that, that could be mined out of the Flare Farm the first year. And then that could be staked in the governance staking pool for um, 5 to 35% um, yield, guaranteed. Um, yeah. yeah, part of the APY Cloud. So that's going to yeah. support that value. Like YFIN has the potential to be... I think the highest priced crypto asset ever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, with that supply being yeah. super low, there's definitely a possibility for sure. So and if Flare takes off in any way, um, with Flare Finance being like the first main DeFi platform on there, definitely a lot of opportunity. Um, well, it has Especially that. since you don't have to buy yeah. it. Like you just earn it with your assets already. So it's like, I don't know why you wouldn't want to take a chance on that and trying to get some. You know, that's the nice thing about all this like, we don't have to pay any mm -hmm. more, you know, if you don't want yeah. to, you don't have to put any more fiat in to start earning all this stuff. Exactly. Um, yeah. And they're going to support the value. So by providing a governance staking pool, because they're holding back 40 million Y Flare and the APY cloud takes a cut, a, a cut of all the fees in the Flare Finance products. So that's what's going to reward everyone for governance staking their Y Fin. And that will just support its value because... You're going to either put it back into the uh, Flare Finance uh, liquidity pools uh, to use it there or Flare Loans, or you're going to stake it. That will support its value, and it comes with premium governance votes where you'll vote on new projects coming, um, and there could be boosted rewards. So um, I just think that's a very fa a very well-designed tokenomics with YFIN. I think they did a really good job with that. You know. All right, on that note, Patty, I think we're going to wrap it up if there's any last questions. This was a long one. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Let me just get back over there. No, man. I'm well, just... yeah, I mean, I think we're good. I think uh, we've answered just, a lot of stuff. I just missed. I wish I didn't hold my snapshot on Exodus now. That ETH prices are so high because I have to pay gas to move my airdrop off Exodus. What? Whoa, 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 whoa. Mr. Uh, Dr. Orlando XRP Hitman Wallace, I had my. Why would you have to pay these high gas fees to move your Spark off of Exodus? Uh, Spark is not on Ethereum, so why would you pay gas fees? Right, Patty? Am I, am I missing something here? Um, I mean, I didn't have to pay any gas fees no. to do my claim, so. No, Spark yeah. is on not on Ethereum. You don't pay gas fees for Spark. So yeah, it's gonna be that. really low on yeah. the Flare network. No, yeah. You don't have to pay gas fees. It's there's nothing on the it's not being built on the Ethereum mainnet, so why would you pay gas fees? Um yeah, Exodus was pretty good with that. I don't think they've announced full support yet though. Um but they had a clean button where you clicked it actually, so I'm sure they'll allow you to hold it. So you won't pay fees. Why would you pay? I don't see why you pay fees unless they charge you. Nah, you're not going to have to. Um, Spark's going to be moving on the Flare network, not on the Ethereum one. And yeah. since it has the FBA design and all that, it, you know, no proof of work, you're not going to have the gas fees like Ethereum. Mm -hmm. That's going to be it's one capped. of the big selling points. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's capped. It definitely yeah. is. Um, Last question, Kevin Noigan, should we buy Flare on BitTrue or wait until release date? Just so everyone knows, um, the IOUs on BitTrue are just one-to-one. -one. If you buy them, you get that on day one, and that's it. So um, I think it's a little high. Um, 
I think it's really high. The Poloniex <laughs> IOUs, you you buying the whole allocation. So you'll only get 15% of what you buy in IOU. So if you bought, say, 10,000 um, Spark IOUs on Poloniex, uh, you only get 1,500 at launch. And then you'll get the regular distribution. So that's what, how they're doing it. Bitrue's only allowing their uh, users to sell the first 15% of their allocation in IOUs. Um, I just think that there's going to be people who just don't understand this and going to sell right away. So you're going to see those weak hands just come out. Um, so I think there will be um, an opportunity. And there's no way that price is, discovery is accurate. It's impossible. I mean, they're, the trading book at the highest I saw was like a little over a million dollars. So I mean, that's peanuts. <laughs> yeah, that's peanuts. I mean, they have less than a million IOUs on Bitru, I believe, is what I saw. Um, but you would trading. Even know those are real tokens, like there's entries in the database. I mean, you don't yeah. know. There's not. They're not attached to the protocol. You know any of that. And um, please, people, don't believe Coinbase's and um, Coin Market Caps and any of these websites for data. Like data, if you see like the circulating supply lower on Coin Market Cap. There's no reason the community should have flipped out like that. Like that, that we just got to be a little more aware and look at the right sources. Um, because, you know, those are the consumer protections that Gensler should be fixing. Things like that. Or Coinbase, when you put stuff on there and they hold it for six days, uphold 60 days. Or when Coinbase goes down right before, um, in the middle of a bull run. Those are the consumer protections I think we need. But still not the SEC's job. So don't we have a court thing? Tomorrow? Is that tomorrow or uh, next week? Uh, is it next Tuesday, maybe? I think it was next Friday. I don't know. I can't remember. It's like the least one that I'm interested in. It isn't it just the... Uh, They're trying to get Ripple to... Ripple, pro- oh, yeah, with lawyer dogs. Yeah. I think the judge going to throw that out. <clears throat> well, I want, she might make the decision on throwing Brad and Chris's out because they have to yeah. produce the SEC docs and their internal high-level communications and external. Um, this could all be over quicker than we think. Uh, and Deaton's coming in, so I don't think we got much longer. Yep. <sighs> so on that note, this was a long, long... Hey, Crypto Erie, how are you? <laughs> wow. Hour and a half. I yeah. We're going to wrap it up here. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Thanks for you guys for uh, tuning in um, and filling up the chat as always. That helps us keep going for a long yes, time. Yes, it does. Um, yeah, Crypto uh, Eerie, I'm here. I'm curious to see what you find on um, that Cohen uh, Group uh, investment bank. I only got a chance to look at it briefly. So they have a lot of subsidiaries. I was just curious what angle, um, you know, maybe uh, PolySign's going with them. Yeah. We'll look into it more, but I thought that was a good announcement. And they got $53 million, and Blockchain.com invested in them too, who's part of Open Coalition. Um, I still got to look into the other VCs that funded them, because that was a big funding. And they also, on a crunch base, it showed they got uh, funding in January too, uh, an undisclosed amount. So uh, that's a lot of funding. You know, Now they're yeah. kind of a, trust, a bank. Also, since Cohen's public, they're going to have to do, you know, their quarterly reports that they file for their shareholders. So I'm curious if we're going to find out some stuff about PolySign through that avenue. Ooh. That'll be, I'm very curious, you know, probably end of July that'll come out. But, I just saw one for May. Yeah. It was out there today. I, I saw it on the website. But. Yeah, but that ended on March 31st. So I, t- I don't know since they just announced it, but we'll have to check that out and see if there was any mention. I feel like probably not. Uh, well, I think it is an interesting... In the future, yeah. It's an interesting when you see that Cohen Group led the funding round of Series B, but they also became strategic partners and planned to integrate in multiple different ways with each other. So um, with the M&A, like you said, with SPAC, uh, I'm not sure what, um, you know, PolySign, Standard Custody's plans there. Can they go public through that? Um, wait, can you repeat that? Can they do the SPAC thing? Uh, they possibly could. I don't, I don't know what the benefits are for that, but yeah, I don't know if they need to do that or not. Yeah. But, um, 
the Wyoming uh, banking regulator, uh, head of banking in Wyoming, uh, liked their uh, thing on LinkedIn. So hopefully they get the uh, fintech charter from uh, OCC if we get a friendly uh, commissioner in there. Yeah. All right, Patty, you're like sounding tired. I know, I am. <laughs> it's been a long uh, day. <laughs> I know, it has. All right, I think we are going to wrap it up right there. Cool. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the super chats. Appreciate it. And I'm Mickey B. Fresh. Patty XRP. And we're out.